we can start anuj okay thanks uh welcome everyone uh, uh this is c city and we are in c conversation number 5 today uh just before i uh, begin today's talk let me give you a brief background about c city c conversation our partners and the curated uh, series of talks and the uh, theme for this semester for those who will be new uh, i think this will orient them to these lectures c city is the school's uh, school of environment and architecture's outreach program and as a part of this program we organize events lectures symposia and exhibitions in order to engage with the larger artistic and cultural discourses sphere within and outside the city as well as the country as today's uh, lecture will also demonstrate uh, so we have uh, uh, this series has been going on over the last 7 years successfully and we have had more than uh, 125 participants talk at this series and this entire archive of talks can be found from our school's website on our c youtube channel so please do subscribe to our channel and watch or any lecture that you may wish to by logging on to the c youtube channel and uh, we are very happy to share that uh, this series of uh, c conversations for this semester this cycle has been supported generally uh, partly by urban center mumbai urban center mumbai is a part of the urban center trust which is a young not for profit organization it was established in 2020 by city practitioners and it aims to build capacities and create democratic platforms to achieve and demonstrate excellence in the planning and design of rapidly urbanizing of uh, um, urban agglomerations in india so um we are very happy to have them as our partners uh, for this event uh, and uh, coming on to the series of talks that we have curated uh, under um, c city this time uh, which is building agency uh, those who who are uh, attending the series since the uh, last few sessions you will understand that um, the series was actually germinated out of our quest to understand that you know what are architects doing beyond uh, beyond actually uh, the scope of serving uh, only purely in uh, individualistic or capitalistic um, in uh, sorry um, uh, in some sense a very mainstream kind of practice which has come to be familiar with uh, with the idea of architecture today um, on in parallel building agency aims to address the question of how architecture becomes relevant for or in society today we are looking we are trying to kind of open up the question of social design through this idea of building agency where there are two main dimensions to this question one is that how does spatial design shape societal relationships and how could a social a spatial practitioner contribute responsibly and put potently into the emerging complexities of spatial operation today the series invites spatial practitioners who have been formulating visions trajectories questions methods and processes through which environmental apparatus may be configured afresh these discussions we expect will offer useful directions for contemporary spatial pedagogy and practice and for this uh, we have had a host of speakers uh, over the last four weeks who have opened uh, opened us up to different kinds of um, tools and modes through which society uh, architects can engage with society and people at large um we have had chal chal agency which is a colombian amdabad amdabad based group which uh, introduced us to the idea of light infrastructures we had matter from goa where rituraj parik and mansi hatangdi opened us up to the idea of um, information and their engagements in social design practice we had swati janu from the so social collab um, and she shared her experiments with engaging with local communities um, in delhi and around last week we had bhavna jemini from the community design agency who spoke to us about her engagements with communities um, uh, from mumbai marginalized communities from mumbai and today and from uh, from also from this uh, chapter we are trying to expand the radius of our understandings and learnings of social design by looking at contexts which are um, which are uh, beyond ours uh, but still very much in our reach 
um today we have uh, chenyun from dingachau mutual aid uh, mutual aid aid society from shanghai uh, and uh, uh, she is going to actually talk to us uh, about the dingachau uh, locality which is a transforming locality uh, and um, we are very uh, um, fortunate to have visited her some time ago when she did a research uh, exchange program with uh with the tongji university and um, we really got to engage and uh, closely look at the works of dinga chao uh, mutual aid agency um i am sure that uh, chenyun will um, tell us more about uh, this organization and her involvement with it but before i hand it over to chenyun i'll give a short introduction to chenyun uh, and uh, uh, then open up uh, and pass it on to her uh, chenyun is born and raised in shanghai in china she was a member of the curatorial team of the 11th shanghai biennale which happened during 2016 17 uh, and curated 50 personae a public program series that revealed the transformational potential of 51 persons or groups in shanghai 50 personae grew out of her work initiating the uh, initi- initiating in the dingachao mutual aid society uh, which she was a part of during 2015 to 18 and it was a self organized venue for studies communication reflection and social services in a working class migrant neighborhood of shanghai her work was inspired by another project that she has been working since 2010 called west havens west havens um india china social thought and contemporary art exchange project she is now working on 50 personae as a, an independent publication project So with that background I would like to invite Chenyun to talk about her journey of Dingai Chao Mutual Aid Society and uh, coming to 51 personae. So welcome Chenyun we are so happy to have you. Thank you Anish for your kind introduction. Uh so uh, I'm very honored to be invited by C which I visited each time I visit Bombay almost. Um and the last time I visited Bombay it was before um COVID-19. um and yeah, i have to say that the experience uh of visiting uh and communicating exchanging ideas with my friends in bombay and observing the local lives has always been uh, one of the major inspirations for my work in shanghai so i find it uh, almost like a gift back uh to my Indian friends and especially Bombay friends uh today. Uh, finally I have a chance to present to you what I have been doing um since my engagement with India in fact at some point. Uh and what I have learned, observed, inspired from you, uh how I try to transform that and make make them practical, practical, uh, understandable and productive in the context of Shanghai today. Uh and of course Shanghai itself has been undergoing huge changes in the past 10 years. Uh and by past 10 years, uh 2010, which the world ex which was the year of world expo in Shanghai was almost a monumental uh year. when uh many logics of an urbanization has been transformed into a pure real estate and capitalist uh, ways mode of production uh and it is just right after the world expo uh, i started to work for west heavens and then i worked on dinghai chiao and then on 51 persona so uh now please allow me to share my stories with you in a brief version but i try my best to make them uh reasonable <laughs> understandable to you because we don't share a lot uh, in common but we also share a lot in common which you will observe in my presentation um so um sharing my screen now okay Uh, so my title is from Dinghai Chao. Dinghai Chao is the place. Uh, it's also a field we worked in Shanghai, a historical working class neighborhood. From Dinghai Chao to Fifty One Personae, and Fifty One Personae was the uh, art project that 
uh, I'm very honored to uh, curate in 2016, but I'm continuing to working on 51 Personality today. So my subtitle is A Journey of Transforming Locality. Um, so in fact, before I start to, to talk about my journey from Ding Hai Chao onward, I would like to talk a little bit backward about how I arrived at Ding Hai Chao. So my background was not architecture or urban planning. My background was journalism and communication. Uh, so in 2004, I left my hometown for the first time in my life after I graduated from a local college to Hong Kong, uh, which in fact, I did have relatives there. I do have some idea through popular culture, but I didn't understand uh, many things until I started to study in the city. Uh, one example and one moment that has really shocked me, uh, which I didn't realize even when I was shocked what it was, was one day in 2004, right after I arrived in Hong Kong, I was brought to a high rise next to Li Tong Street, which is in Wan Chai, which is not Hong Kong Island. And my local friend who is from Video Power, which is, uh, a local activist uh, video uh, movement uh, people, a group. So they showed me to uh, look at uh, this Li Tong street from above. So it looks to me like any street in Hong Kong, but in fact, it was at the end of its local struggle. So this street, also known as the Wedding Card Street, is going to be demolished. And all these local stores and communities will be relocated. So this was done in 2000, uh, uh, before 2004, and almost by 2005, the whole project, uh, 2005, 2006, the whole project is over. And now this street is gone and is replaced by uh, Urban Renew Authority of Hong Kong um, into a high-end shopping center, but it's mostly feeling uh, quite dead. So there were a lot of discussions and even popular songs based on this struggle. But at that time when I was just freshly graduated from Shanghai, I had no idea about urbanism or city. Uh, in fact, I'm just one of the witnesses. I'm, I'm just one of the witness of this. But this moment always come back to me once and again. I, another journey to Shanghai during my master years in Hong Kong was I was I was asked in 2005 to visit one street in in my mother town. So I select this street, which was uh, not very far from where I live, and it's just in fact in between uh, my home and my high school. Uh, I visit the street because uh, it was. A local, the government, local government launched, launched a project of regeneration at the end of the century, before the millennium. Uh, it is a project began in 1998 to conserve and restore the historical buildings on Duolun Road, which is the name of this road, a very narrow and uh, small street, and turn them into museums, galleries, cafes, or crafts shops. Uh, and at that time, I figured that uh, this street doesn't look very normal again, but once you go back to the street, which you will find in the right hand side of this PPT, which is the back street life, and the left hand side is the street life, which has been uh, modified and clarified and upgraded uh, to the extent that you feel that it, they don't belong to one world. So it was a big puzzle to me. So this place uh, called Dolan Road, uh, I will get back to this at the end of my talk, which is like a circle that is finally fulfilled. But back in 2005, I just visited for a couple of days and wrote an essay uh, on how the government imagined a successful uh, cultural, a cultural version of a road can be serve the purpose of commemorating the culture and celebrating the celebrities and serve the tourism, but how it looks so odd. And a very important and much longer meaningful journey is the West Heavens project, which brought me journey to the West, which is India. Uh, so there are many things that I can recall, which is very touching to me uh, and very confusing also to me at that point. Uh, but I remember uh, 
my first visit to Delhi was in 2010, and my first visit uh, destination was not any tourist site, but uh, CSDS in Sarai. So it's in March 2010 that I visited Sarai and talked to Rex Media Collective and learned about Sarai. Uh, at that time, I was very refreshed by and amazed by how come such a platform can be realized uh, with so many um, uh, vibrancies uh, and so many uh, energies uh, on issue of media, urban life, and the public domain. So uh, it's it was a very pioneering project uh, that inspired me at that time, although by 2010, it has already passed its peak time. And secondly, the visit to Bombay, uh, a very interesting moment was when I when we were uh, visiting uh, art spaces and meeting the artists and urbanists at that time. Uh, first, I realized that the urbanists architects are the same group as the artists, which doesn't, which was not the, which was not true in, in China, while experts like urbanists and architects, they belong to one category, which has nothing to do with the art scene. Uh, and the art world doesn't seem to concern about urban reality uh, back 11 years ago, at least. Uh, another moment was when we were taking a taxi in Bombay. The taxi driver asked us what, what we were, we came, what we were from, and we said we are from Shanghai. And the taxi driver said in his um, very strong accent, English saying that uh, Shanghai, Bombay, same, 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 same thing. I think she's talking about it's the same thing. Uh, it's a way from his perspective how he see the two cities, which from my perspective seems to be quite different in many levels. But uh, then I realized that uh, there was a Shanghai dream or Shanghai model uh, in uh, in the uh, at least in the bureaucracies in. Um, in the planners' minds in, in Bombay. So that was the birth of the name of the project called Same Same Project, a Bombay Shanghai Research and Urbanity, which lasted for six years from 2010 to 2016. And at that time, Rupali was also part of it, Prasad was also part of it. And we continued to work with different universities and sometimes even artists and designers in Shanghai with Bombay students on a particular site in Shanghai. And one of them, one year, happens to be Ding Haichiao. Uh, the discovery of Ding Haichiao. Oh, I'm sorry, there's one photo missed in the bit in the middle. So the discovery of Ding Haichiao happened in 2013 when Same Same Project uh, needs to find another site. And I suggest that we don't look for another friend, former colonial part of Shanghai, which looks always as if very nostalgic and fancy. But let's look at somewhere else. So one professor in Tongji University, a young lecturer, in fact, he said that he happens to be researching on another part of the Yangpu district, uh, which is in the northeast of Shanghai. So this is where Ding Haichiao locates. And the part of Ding Haichiao that we visited and researched and did our field work for the workshop in 2013 was the north part of Ding Haichiao. It was by the time when the metro line reached there. So the Metro line number 12 just opened, uh, uh, launched um, that same year in November, but the demolishing of this whole area started two or three years before. By the time 2013, when we visit there, there were still around 100, what we would call uh, neo home households, neo, they're like, they stick to the ground and don't want to be removed by the government easily. So that's the name we call them. So we talked to them and did our research there and tried to understand their situation. So in this map, you will know that uh, in 1979, uh, this the same area uh, used to be um, uh, new working class neighborhoods constructed by the state owned enterprises and the government since 1950s to 1970s. It's very intimate. It's also very orderly. It has parks and all these uh, working class uh, facilities. Uh, but by in the right hand, by 2019, uh, it has mostly been demolished. And that's because the arrival of the metro line, which has upgraded the land price. Uh, so now it is under construction today for real estate housing. So the same thing workshop in 2013 is called Other Histories. Um, 
So one side it was the uh, Bombay uh, architect students, uh, underground uh, undergraduates, and on the other hand, we uh, in for the Chinese side we invited artists and designers, independent, to join this workshop. So we did exhibitions in uh, the demolished half demolished uh, sites uh, and we did exhibitions of photographs of locals and we add some um, we, we did screenings and sometimes we uh, did some field trips with the locals so uh, this workshop we are asked to do intervention uh, in the half middle uh, middle way and we uh, and all the participants needs to find out a proposal and to realize that proposal in the community. So it is quite an um, unusual workshop where mostly in the past uh, we are only asked to observe and to record and to present. And this workshop, um, everyone is asked to not only to describe and to represent, but also to intervene. So what's the meaning of intervene? It becomes something very uh, crucial, uh, interesting uh, in the next stage. And after this uh, was over, uh, I was asked by those Chinese artists and designers who have participated in that workshop that uh, they encouraged me to propose to uh, the first Emerging Curator Prize uh, in Power Station of Art in Shanghai. And this is the museum. Um, uh, which host Shanghai Biennale. So I was encouraged by them. But at that time, I was very hesitating because I'm not very sure if it is a good idea or if it's proper or if it's correct. And what does it mean to transform a workshop experience? Although it is a very intense workshop and we all enjoyed it and fascinated by the neighborhood. But to transform it into an exhibition pro proposal, it seems to be... Uh, quite dra dramatic. So I hesitated for a long time until I uh, write up a proposal and send it the very last day before the deadline. Uh, and even it's an extended deadline. Uh, but fortunately, for some reason, uh, this proposal won the first prize. So I've been granted quite some money for budget, as a budget to produce this exhibition. And the exhibition, to prepare for it, we have only three months. And to spare the money, because in the proposal, I already said that I want to uh, establish something called Mutual Aid Society. It's written in my exhibition proposal. So I spare the money out of transportation production. I try to limit the cost of production as much as I can. And all the artists are from locals, so there is no transportation. From, uh, from from outside the city. Uh, and we try to not to, to make full use of all the materials and borrow things instead of produce new things. So by this, we spare the money uh, that can rent a three-story house, private house in the Haichao for one year. And the exhibition itself lasted for quite long. And to prepare for the exhibition, uh, we have about six or seven workshop groups that did investigations and researches on topics like uh, football, local history of football, gangster, uh, factories, migrant dialect, uh, family history, soundscape, uh, all these aspects, and ended up in this kind of research based, but very uh, hurried research based exhibition, uh, as you can see on the right hand side. Um, but then um, I easily find a three story. Um, house. Uh, each story is about uh, 15 square meters, which I don't know how many square feet. Uh, one floor, it's three storied. It happens to be out uh, for rent uh, after some renovation by the landlord. So I rent it um, since 2014. And we try to do something. But still, we are really exploring what to do properly. We don't have any agenda. So what we can think is, for example, some low cost uh, exhibitions, like in the right hand side, you saw, uh, there's a sculpture, uh, which is like a mushroom that is growing, but also decaying. It's by an artist who is talking about his grandmother who was just relocated uh, in this area, who has been working in the factory uh, 
and who has been very marginalized in the factory. So it's about her life experience in the local state run uh, factory, which was later after 1990s become a joint venture. And on the left side, uh, it was a second year, 2014, same thing workshop. Uh, Ding Haichao was so interesting that we decided to make the same site, our uh, field in 2014 workshop. But the difference is, is that we now have a two story, three story room house for the exhibition to happen there uh, locally and to invite locals to come and observe. So uh, the whole exhibition has attracted a lot of interests from the local government level and the uh, uh, people. The real beginning of Mutual Aid Society owned a lot to one retired art teacher, Mr. Xu Guangzhu. He happens to be the father of a curator uh, in the Rock Band Art Museum in Shanghai, who has studied abroad in France. And Mr. Xu used to teach her, his daughter art when, and painting when uh, she was young. And throughout his life, he has been teaching in Children's Palace, which is a socialist system, but we still have it today in China, um, which is supposed to teach art and culture, mostly art courses, with very low cost uh, to the local children. So he has been teaching in Children's Palace art uh, before he retired. And it is the first time that he has ever been to this part of the city. So he is very inspired, although he is from the, he has been living uh, in the French concession part, uh, and it's, which is quite another social class. So this neighborhood has inspired him and he has been designing new courses, for example, doing experimental education by playing music to encourage them to paint music and to encourage them to paint um, collectively so at the end uh, it's a six it's a six month teaching one semester and the nine girls uh mostly migrant families girls they they have to come every saturday and he teach them free and at first they were suspicious of why you teach them free but gradually now uh, the, the parents are very happy to send their kids here and we host a two-story um exhibition at the end so in the second row on the left, you see the exhibition opening. Uh, and th that curtain was a uh, collective work by all the um, students. And, and another interesting thing is that we invited um, some students from sociology background department to interview these families, because although uh, Mr. Xu has been teaching them. She never asked them about their personal issues. She only teach them art and she never go visit them families. She never talked to, he, he never talked to the parents because later on the parents just send the kids to, uh, to our classroom and the parents uh, don't even send the uh, kids to our classroom and they just come walk by themselves. So he doesn't bother with his private issues, but only to teach them in art and understand the kids through art. While these sociology students, they uh, actively uh, interviewed and visit these families. And at the end, we had a round table, as you will find in the last photo, uh, when all the students reported what they had interviewed about these the stories, about where they live, what's the family business, uh, and what they feel. And it's the first time that Mr. Xu learned about these stories. But the amazing thing is that um, this doesn't really uh, uh, compensate, or this doesn't show that there's a lack of knowledge, you know, because through, through, through this pedagogic experience with these girls in the past six months, Mr. Xu has already established a trust and understanding through art with the kids. And he finally said, his, shared his personal story that his passion for this course comes in fact uh, very much as an aftermath of 1960s when he just graduated from school, was sent to rural China during the Cultural Revolution to teach rural kids. And at that time, 
he realized that there are many college graduates who are from top elite universities in China were also sent to these rural, uh, rural villages to teach kids. I think he, he said he recalled this experience almost unconsciously, but feel it very relevant to the kind of stories that the students shared with him about these family histories. This whole experience, although it was not curated by me at all, I only encouraged it to happen, but it was in fact an experience under, uh, it was a project realized totally um, by Mr. Xu, but it has led me great courage and great inspiration uh, to start the Mutual Aid Society. So one thing uh, that we have continued to do in Dinghai, in Dinghai Chao is called Dinghai Talk. So by 2015, uh, there was a program in Shanghai and also in China. Uh, for example, in Shanghai, there was a goal by the government cultural bureau to construct 100 new museums in the city. So there seems to be a very top-down need for museum space, either it's culture, art, or history, and in particular, art and culture. And all these places were constructed in relation to the government planning or to the private tourist developers. And they were always located in some nice places that is decent and has the potential to, to sell. Uh, so at that time, I realized that it doesn't matter what you talk that much, but where you talk about them and to whom. So in 2015 to 2018, we curated 85 sessions of Ding Hai Talk by inviting passers-by lecturers because we have no budget of any kind uh, to do. So it's a zero budget, pri uh, zero budget project. And since uh, the first year, we used up all our leftovers of the, for the rent. So uh, the second year onward, I personally paid for the rent, which uh, luckily was not very high. But other than that, we really uh, don't have a budget to do like inviting somebody from even outside Shanghai. Uh, so what we do is whenever we know, and I know that someone is passing, I will ask him, Mostly they were invited to do something else related to culture in the city or academic. I asked him to just spend one evening or one afternoon uh, in the Haichal and to give a talk of some kind. So it is very interesting because first, before the guests arrive at our space, our place, uh, they need to take the metro and they need to walk. And this walking journey, although it doesn't take very long, is a very big um, experience, important experience for them to understand uh, the condition, the, the part of Shanghai that will hardly come to them if they were just uh, going to a university or to a museum to give a talk. So sometimes I'll ask them to go to the north part of Ding Hai Chiao to, to, to take a tour of the demolishing site and to talk and meet those new household people. And I will ask them to uh, walk through the market street, which leads to our society. And this market street is a very vivid example of street market in Shanghai, which has been uh, demolished since 1990s under the name of sanitary and all others. Uh, and sometimes I even uh, invite them to eat local food uh, and to do some local shopping, which they would love to. Uh, and they will feel that they are connected and they uh, understand much better where they are talking. Uh, and this is a kind of locality that will host their knowledge. So it is not I, me, or my friend who is hosting them. It is this place that is hosting their knowledge. So it is a locality that can facilitate certain knowledge sharings with certain audiences. I think this is so important that uh, uh, every, every each time I realize that when we um, have this talk going on, uh, the kind of language, this, this will even influence the kind of language that the lecturer uh, will use. Uh, 
uh, because this experience has persuaded them to reshape their knowledge a little bit and to readjust themselves uh, to another condition. Uh, so the characters of this Ding Hai Talk series is that it is self-organized. Uh, it's free admission, but of course, if you want to donate a little sum of money, it's welcomed. There's no lecture fee, so everyone come to, uh, to share knowledge for free, but they really can get interactive uh, uh, responses. And thirdly, it's very informed. Uh, so you can see in the pictures the kind of settings we have. It's a very limited space, either the first floor or second floor. It's 15 square meters at most. So if you have two people coming, you feel it's fine. And if you have 10 people come, you feel, oh, it's quite crowded. And if you have 20, then you feel overwhelming. But it always uh, feels like home-like. But also, it is serious because the kind of topics we're addressing is serious. And it's public. It's not like a private invitation. It's public because we announce them publicly. Anyone can come as long as all each and every audience introduce themselves to the lecturer first before the lecturer start to talk. And it's very intimate and sincere. And it's very direct because, because it's... Uh, it's a place that you can just talk about almost anything. You don't have to worry about any taboos. Uh, and it's personal. Uh, it's very relational. So each time what kind of uh, knowledge can be produced, depending on the relationship between uh, through the lecture that is constructed between the lecturer and the audience. Uh, and it's very frequent. So every week, uh, uh, we have at least one, and sometimes two, and sometimes three sessions, because it's quite easy to uh, to manage such a small space to adjust it. And sometimes when the audience comes, some will come earlier and just to voluntarily prepare. And so, what kind of topics we have? Um, we have five sessions. The first session is called City as We Know It. So it is about urban, urban experience, urban studies, urbanism, uh, urban activists. Uh, sometimes it's from abroad and sometimes it's about Shanghai itself. So I'm sharing with you here the images of our Indian friends visiting the Hai Chao, which is not all of them, uh, but I just want to uh, show my attribute to, <laughs> to my Indian friends. Mm. And um, second is called Art That Works. So uh, we want to share and invite uh, people who have been working in the art world, but who has been uh, implementing their knowledge and transforming society through art. Mostly uh, they work through a collective and sometimes through individuals. And the third is called Another Asia. So this also has a lot to do with my experience with, with India and with interracial school at that time, uh, when suddenly we realized that we need to understand uh, another Asia, which is Asia beyond diplomat and Asia beyond tourism. Uh, and many knowledge that history on, on the history and struggle of the Asian people should be brought to us. So we are very lucky because sometimes we can even have our Malaysian, Taiwan, Hong Kong friends really come, drop by Shanghai, we'll just grab, we'll just grab him or her to, to Ding Hai Chao. And also we do screening and we have another section which is called On Rural. So here we never see rural as an opposite of city. But gradually, we want to bring rural back to the scene, especially when we are in Ding Hai Chao, when many migrants are just from rural, and they're not very disconnected to rural, and they're still connected to rural and relevant to rural. And what we have been doing in the city is very relevant to what we are thinking about rural. Especially uh, in Shanghai, in such a city, there are many experiments from different organizations who claim that they are working on rural. So we are inviting these people to come and share their experiences with the rural and question them. So uh, to put the story short, uh, there are other projects in Ding Hai Chao that um, um, I think it's like workshops and programs. For example, we hosted a 
after school program for half a year. And there are artist residences because it's so expensive to live in Shanghai that we provide those artists who would like to work for us and work, uh, produce something in Dinghai Chao related to the community and the history and the people there, uh, uh, a place to live and, and, and an intersection to talk. So it's a, an artist residency. I think it is one of the cheapest artist residency in Shanghai, and maybe the only one um, possible in Shanghai. And uh, we have a, a, a series of pro, um, projects related to children's people's kitchen, which is um, food related. I will show you one of uh, such a program, uh, uh, people's kitchen program later. Um, because food is something, because we are next to a food market, so food is something fundamental to human life. And the price of food and the use of food and the food and people uh, can tell us a lot about the local life and uh, uh, generational experiences. And we also did community theatre, as you will find. Uh, in our other uh, pictures with children uh, and sometimes with adults, with friends, like a marathon, uh, like a short marathon experience. And also a uh, uh, street vendor, we show us, uh, we try to uh, have our street vendor booth uh, on the street uh, as, a community, uh, as a society. And we share and sell something on the street and discuss um, whatever we sell with our local friends, community members. So now I want to show you one particular case uh, that is quite important. It happened in 2015. Uh, it's called uh, One Night Food at Dong Si Wen Li. So Dong Si Wen Li is in a traditionally upper classes uh, city center in, a, we call it, uh, upper corner. In Shanghai dialect, we divide the city into bottom corner, lower corner, like Ding Hai Chao, which belongs to working class, and upper corner, uh, which belongs to uh, like bourgeois, especially. Uh, this has been a tradition, this division was there uh, ever since uh, the colonial period. And Dong Si Wen Li was one of these um, communities in upper corner which was very decent house, historically decent houses, but it's also under demolishing in 2015. And so we were asked by a curator to join a one night exhibition art event within this neighborhood. Uh, this neighborhood was under demolishing, uh, but there are still some uh, people who haven't gone yet. And for some reason, uh, that year, this French curator got this permission to create one night show there. So at that time, we found that it will be interesting just to bring food from Ding Hai Chao and cook them in Dong Si Wen Li. So we got a budget of 1,000 RMB, which is like 10,000 rupees. So we purchased some half-cooked local food, street foods in Ding Hai Chao and brought them there. And so many, many like art lovers visited this site. They were all very hungry. And because it's already a neighborhood under demolishing, all shops around this community has already been closed. So our shop, one night shop, food shop, becomes the only food shop that is possible and reachable. So we sell the food the same price as they were sold in the Hai Chao. So interestingly, both the art lovers who come all the way to enjoy a one night show in this Dong Si Wen Li and these local residents who haven't yet reached an agreement or who don't want to leave yet, who are still trapped in this decaying neighborhood, all come out and very curious about the food that we are selling. And even the local resident says that oh my God, the foods that you're selling are so cheap. They're much even cheaper than they would be sold here. So here we raised, uh, we, we make food enjoyable, but also raise the issue of cost of living. So at that time, there has been arguments from the urban uh, planners, from uh, scholars, uh, from a historical narrative saying that Dong Si Wen Li is precious because 
uh, it's one of the biggest and entire and beautiful uh, architectural typography of Shanghai, which is a Shukuman. And this kind of uh, neighborhood should be preserved in their narrative because uh, it's very precious in its architecture. But what we brought to them is that uh, the cost of living is very important. So I'm here by showing you a short video uh, of, um, of this um, one day experience. I will just jump it because it's a bit um, long. Uh, I'll skip it. Um, Can you see it? Yes, we can. Uh, yeah, you can make it full screen and maybe you might want to remove your earphones for us to hear it. So can you hear it? Yes. Okay, so this is uh, in the evening when we were in Dong Si Wen. I'm trying to explain to them what we are doing. And this is in the daytime when we are purchasing from foods in Binghai Chow, the half-cooked foods in Binghai Chow. And we are also trying to understand the history of these foods because some, uh, some shops have longer history and some of them have been already removed from other parts of Shanghai to Binghai Chow because the other sites were demolished. So we purchased them half-cooked and packed them to the city center where Dong Su Wen Yi locates. So, and then we uh, set up a temporary sh shop with the help of the local residents. One of them happens to be a, um, a technician. So we're trying to see whether we should move it inside or outside. So we are playing as a street vendor and try to find the best location. So this is how it was sold. It was very well cut. So this is a local resident who is talking to us about why he had she hasn't uh, moved out. So this is the kitchen we are using temporary in this neighborhood, which is still functioning. So these are the local grandmas who are talking about it's really a nice and cheap dumplings. And you still feel that they're... So she wants to invite another old lady uh, to, to have one of them. So she get one out of this uh, basket. So it's very... Uh, it's a traditional neighborhood uh, kind of personal relations. And this booth, which is selling beer, this is a, they used to have a proper shop here. And then because of the demolishing, they lost this shop. So, but to take this chance of this one night um, event, so they immediately come back and sell beer. It's an alcohol shop. So they were telling us that they have been here for 13 years and the rent has been increasing, but despite all this, they have been here. 
But now, because the whole neighborhood is gone, so they have to think about what to do next. So, yeah. Um, so this is a photo of the same neighborhood uh, in 2017, just two years after our event. So with the effort uh, of many historians, especially urban planners, um, scholars, the whole neighborhood was, pres was preserved um, because the value of its um, architecture is recognized. However, all the residents um, has gone. And you can see that this, this neighborhood is still there, but surrounding this neighborhood are high rises. Earlier, they want to demolish the whole neighborhood and replace it with high rises. And now they want it to preserve as it is because it's valuable. But all the former residents have already been removed and relocated. So this is the aftermath. And this is the result of a kind of debate that is only caring about the, uh, the, the architectural value of a certain kind, as if the architecture itself is the pure memory and uh, can represent history. So uh, in 2016, uh, I was, by the end of 2015, I remember um, Rex Media Collective and Polly uh, invited me to join the curatorial team of uh, 11th Shanghai Biennale. And in fact, uh, since its beginning uh, in 1990s, Shanghai Biennale is one of the oldest Biennale in, Sh in China, has never had a non-West foreign curator. And by that year, Rex Media Collective was the first non-West foreign curator we've got. Um, so they proposed to me that uh, the project of 51 Personae, and I love this idea so much, feeling that I'm destined to do it. And um, thus I paid my uh, full attention to the curating and organizing realization of this project. So uh, what is 51 Personae? So uh, in fact, this we have a description of it, as you can see uh, on our website. However, uh, the, the answer to it is, ever open. So what is 51 Personae? I have been asked uh, by this question since 2016 and to today, still people are asking me, uh, what is 51 Personae? And why he or she, this or that is 51 Personae while others are not, are not. So it is a very interesting question that is always relevant to what I'm doing. Although it looks very direct and sometimes a little bit now, but in fact, it is somehow also inspiring. Uh, in fact, 51 Personae, uh, it becomes 51 because there are three weeks uh, in uh, during the biennial. And each week, there's, sorry, there are seven weeks during the biennial, three months, and each week, three events uh, in the city. So we open court proposals from the people and also we uh, invited different people through our research. Um, in fact, finally, all these projects, uh, events were curated, not by me solely, uh, by my Dinghai Chao friends, as well as by the personae themselves. So what are these? Sometimes they are a local cook who used to study sculpture, but only like cooking street food and to do it as a living. Sometimes it's about local uh, working class soccer team. Sometimes it is about hand paint uh, art workers who used to paint cinema posters, film posters. Sometimes it is about uh, collectors of um, candy labels. Uh, and sometimes it is uh, about motorbike riders when in this context of Shanghai, motorbike is uh, restricted uh, throughout uh, the past 10, 20 years. So they are all very different from each other, but they all function from their own perspective something which is relevant, which is very relevant and unique 
and echoes to our experience as someone who's living in Shanghai back then and today. So I'm sharing with you one story from 51 Personae, which have a lot to do and uh, with how 51 Personae becomes a publication project. So one story is about Jing Yunli. So we are back to Dolan Road again. So this is the map of Dolan Road in 2019 and, uh, and 1979. So the red star is where Jing Yunli locates. So if you know, there is a famous left-winged uh, writer, uh, left-wing but not communist, uh, who is regarded as one of the most important thinkers and writers of 1920s and 30s, whose name is Lu Xun. Lu Xun spent her, his last 10 years in Shanghai and he passed away in Shanghai. And one of his former residences was in Jing Yunli. So Jing Yunli was a neighborhood in uh, back street, in one of the back streets of Dolan Road, which I shared with you uh, at the beginning of my presentation. So at that time, uh, an artist friend introduced me to Miss Chen, who was her landlord. Um, she has been living, Miss Chen has been living in US and Shanghai, uh, but she has always been moving back and forth. And at that time, if you look at these two maps, you will realize that uh, uh, many parts of this neighborhood has been demolished and now becomes temporary uh, uh, parking places. But earlier, it was a very lively, as you can see in 1979, it was a very lively uh, neighborhood. So Jing Li happens to be at the edge of this neighborhood. Uh, which is now, uh, when you look out of the window, many houses have already been demolished. So uh, the, the government's idea is to preserve, again, to preserve this neighborhood because one famous figure used to live there. Uh, but uh, for the first line of this neighborhood where Miss Chen's house was located, they want to remove the people out of this house and use this house for other purposes, which is unknown. But they want to remove you from your own house without demolishing the house, but to use it for some other purpose. So this is the reason why Miss Chen doesn't want to leave. So the first, this is in 2016 for 51 Personae, I visited Miss Chen the first time in the summer. So by that time, the neighborhood was already under demolishing. Um, this, is, this was his home uh, in Jing Yunli. And there was a big war between him and neighbors because his neighbors has agreed to, to be removed, uh, but he, she hasn't. Uh, and then I realized that Miss Chen um, is a local a self learned writer on local history. And he, she herself is very familiar with Lu Xun. And she showed me a book, which is the woodblock uh, paintings by Zhao Yanyan on Lu Xun's novels. And our 51 Personae event was purely from her story. And she has curated herself by saying that she would prefer these Lu Xun novel paintings very, um, important artistically and socially to be reproduced on the walls of her own house. So this was the original book painting and this was how we reproduced them uh, collectively uh, as the 51 Personae event in the daytime. So we reproduced these wood block prints uh, at the outside of the walls which is from the 1930s uh, novels. Um, this was the daytime and by the evening, Ms. Chen invited some people uh, who are from neighboring communities who also don't want to leave uh, to give a talk. And we screened the documentary film uh, of them. Uh, and we invite our friends to come and uh, witness um, this scene. 
So by the next year, this time, uh, there was a first forced eviction. Uh, forced eviction is when you refuse to talk or you refuse to re reach an agreement with the government. The government will ask, uh, not themselves, but they will ask someone to remove all your belongings from your house one day and remove you also from this house and to block the house. So this is uh, called forced eviction. Um, so this is what happened after the first eviction and what happened to our prank, prank uh, uh, to the walls um, one year later. And this is two years later in 2019. Uh, it's the second, after the second forced eviction, because after the first one happened, Miss Chen moved herself back again. So there happened a second forced eviction. And this time, um, there was a new label on the wall, uh, which is a history description. So they deliberately, the local government, put a sign saying this is genuinely and how the history is like in English and in Chinese with a card, uh, with, a, uh, uh, with these information uh, for tourists. Uh, so uh, in 2019, after the second eviction, Ms. Chen moved back again. And then this time they removed and repainted the whole walls and only leave this sign of the history of Jimin Lee by the government. Uh, but however, after Ms. Chen moved in, our friends moved in again with her and make use of the site again for screening and events. And there comes the third forced eviction uh, in November. So this time they also removed the staircases. So now you cannot come down if you live on the second floor. So this is how Ms. Chen decided to live. So he lived on the second floor with no staircase, uh, he is communicating with the outside uh, uh, with a rope. So after uh, all these, so I'll show you first uh, if we have time. Maybe we don't have time. Okay. So uh, so after that, uh, I have been asking Miss Chen because I have been communicating with her for the past couple of years, discussing strategies and discussing uh, what to do. Uh, she is an she is a writer and a columnist in 1990s, um, and kind of intellectual. However, uh, she cannot write her stories, which make uh, properly because it's such a big trauma. Uh, but I realized that she can she can knit. So Jing Yunli J Y L uh, and number seven. So she I realized that she can knit. So I asked her to knit. So this becomes one of the publications of uh, 51 Personae, by a 51 Personae. So we not only make posters for the sock, we also uh, made um, another, art, another artist who know the story, make a silver scarf uh, about the story, make it into a, a children's story a metaphorical story and a letter from number seven, Jing Ling Li. And we also uh, invite Ms. Chen to come and sell them in an art book fair and in the museums uh, as a way to express. And uh, in the last um, event at the end of the year 2019, when Ms. Chen was forced to leave her home for a third time, many people learned about this, this time through online. So they come and support mostly very young people who didn't know her uh, back in 2016. Uh, some of them don't know her until when they know learned about it uh, online. So they come and support uh, and witnessed mostly because you can't do much, so they witnessed. Uh, the scene. So what to do? So we invited about 20 of them um, to write what they have seen. 
and uh, the title is called The Last Time I Saw. So they were all invited to uh, write an essay. And uh, I finally added them in uh, a kind of timeline, uh, which is from back 2016 to 2020, uh, to the moment that the last time uh, we saw her, because she was kind of arrested for 11 days by the local government. Um, at that time, we were all very worried. So this is what we did. And we the cover happens to be also a, a reproduction of a wood block print by the granddaughter of Zhao Yanyan, who was the author, um, artist of Lu Xun's novel, uh, the wood block print that we used uh, outside the wall of Miss um, Chen. So this artist was the granddaughter and she was very touched by what we have been doing to her grandfather's work. And she said that if I want to use her work, I can use her work as part of this publication. Uh, so this is uh, how the story um, of 51 Personae started as a publication. So if we look back, it used to be a very site-specific uh, project in Dinghai Chiao. Um, but now, um, especially after 2017, um, the kind of cost of living and the rent has increased also in Dinghai Chiao. It has all increased and now Dinghai Chiao is under demolishing. So I'm thinking uh, why publication can be a way um, to uh, inherit the spirit and experience. So it is, to, uh, it is a strategy to work from site. We're not escaping site, but we're still working on site, but we also work on paper. And from a kind of action, which was very intense, um, when I was in Dinghai Chiao, to a kind of action as documentation and documentation of actions. And from curating, which is also about artists, uh, which is also about the expression of an artist or individual or a collective, uh, to editing, which you always keep in mind the readership. And from time limited, because each like 51 persona is time limited, uh, and the kind of urbanization that we are having today in Shanghai is also very timely restricted. Something stand there yesterday will disappear tomorrow. Someone lived there yesterday disappeared tomorrow. It's at that level. So it's very hard for you to grasp. However, we want to make it everlasting by uh, representing them on paper and to digest them and to discover them again and again by the future people. And from space bonded to freedom of expression. So freedom of expression. Um, so why I call my project is now 51 Personae an independent publication is because um, in China, not like in the rest of the world, I don't know about North Korea. So ISBN, which is what we have, um, for any book, if you need, you want to have an ISBN that is recognized uh, by the Chinese government and can, can be circulated officially in China, uh, it is monopolized through publication uh, publishers. So it is through this system that, that censorship is implemented. Is, is, is implemented. So uh, if you publish your book with no Chinese ISBN or with no ISBN at all. It can only be, rec uh, be recognized as um, independent. Uh, independent is a good way to put it. And in fact, it is not that legal even. However, just like uh, Ding Hai Chiao started as an art exhibition proposal uh, to today, uh, there are still some space in China when art is quite useful in the sense that we have art publications in China, which has mostly no ISBN, and we have art book fair, and some limited uh, independent bookstores who are willing to sell independent publications. Uh, only that uh, we cannot uh, uh, go to the main market 
and be read by the majority of the people. However, uh, I think as long as there's such a space, um, uh, I think there are many things that can still be done and be explored and we don't have to wait. We don't have to wait until a certain urban policy is launched, which is beyond our reach. And we don't have to wait until some scholars stand out and say that some certain neighborhood needs to be protected, which in any case won't work in our sense. And we don't have to wait until some certain NGOs come out and say that they are taking up some responsibilities for the locals, which in fact is now outsourcing of the government money. So this independence, I think, uh, has transformed into a certain position uh, that throughout the Dean High Child experience, we want to grasp, which is a direct link to the people, um, a direct link to the author, which take uh, this um, responsibility to take this, this risk to express uh, and to share finally what we think is uh, worthwhile uh, to be uh, recorded either ideas or narratives or stories or representations um, with a vast audience of the future. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chen Yun. Um, thank you for taking us through this entire journey of, uh, you know, the transformations and redevelopments and demolitions, which actually has been um, a site in a lot of South Asian countries, including our city and many other big cities in India also. So, so the experience is quite relatable. And, and um, given, the, given the whole uh, context of building agency and our thematic for this series of talks, I think your talk really opens up and brings uh, two, three ideas through which um, uh, we can engage and expand upon our um, uh, uh, upon our agency, and one of which is actually the idea of um, uh, of the exhibition and curation uh, of how we can think of curation uh, as a tool to engage with the society. How we can use uh, the exhibition as a platform to connect with the community, to engage them in issues that may concern them. And I think that was one very important takeaway for me. And the way in which you actually positioned it, uh, that how, how there are artists, there are architects, and then um, uh, there's the urban realm and how they kind of uh, get tied together through this act of uh, curation in the whole process. So I think that was a very interesting um, uh, kind of thing that you opened out. The second was uh, to think of uh, teaching and engaging in uh, passing of cultural knowledge into uh, into the um, community and engaging uh, through experimental education, modes of experimental education that can actually be extracted or um, can be um, you know foregrounded in these endeavors um, and uh, and thereby using artistic interventions to to stage um, uh, to state certain kind of new histories uh, and bring back alternative histories which are not otherwise present in the cultural imagination of the public uh, however with with these two things I'm kind of in a very ironical uh, uh, position where when you explain that what happened eventually is um, that the government decided to preserve the neighborhood, but it uh, it removed all its people from from the place. And I was kind of uh, very dumbfounded in my in, in, in this whole explanation, because here is um, someone concerned who is producing so much cultural value through curatorial and exhibitory work for this very place. But now it is completely emptied out and almost musified. You know, it's almost kind of made into an object of consumption where the people are no longer there. So I just wanted to kind of ask you what you feel about it. And, you know, this whole uh, double-edged nature of uh, curation that has somehow played out in, in, this, uh, in this transforming uh, place. 
Yeah, this is a very important question. In fact, it is very crucial to our practice. Yeah. Uh, because I realized that there are more, I think now 90, almost 90, 95% of all the cultural projects, productions, events that were curated in the city of Shanghai yeah. are serving the purpose of a more capitalized ways of uh, consuming land right. uh, and history. So for example, most of the museums, uh, most of the museums belongs to real estate developers. Mm. So why they allow you, uh, it's, on one hand, it seems to be like uh, a possibility for you to be seen. Mm. But however, fundamentally, you are serving them. Got it. And to what extent can your critics overcome uh, this kind of uh, absorption mm. from their end, either government or um, capital, or, or the capital? Uh, and what I, I tend to think that now, one thing is that you don't collaborate at all. I won't curate, mm. I won't participate, mm. unless I'm very sure that what I talked about will overtune uh, yourself. Yeah. So I will overtune whatever you have trying to establish, construct yeah. a kind of cultural idea, right. uh, which is serving fundamentally the purpose against people, in fact. Right. Uh, so, if you don't allow me to talk, then this they can don't allow. They can say they are censorship, whatever. Then I will not collaborate. Mm, right. So because otherwise, if it is very ambiguous mm. or it is well sometimes too abstract or mm. ambiguous, just pure ambiguity, mm. doesn't work. Right. Because finally, it becomes part of their contributions to the society. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes th that contribution they don't even care. Yeah. Because what they want is sometimes just an exposure, yeah. a report to the government, or how many numbers of audience show up. Okay. So they're ma even making use of the audience who are coming as a kind of capital. Mm. So yes. this whole logic, I think, has to be very cautious. Yes. That you. So why independent publication? Now all these real spaces have become so monopolized mm. by the developer and the government mm. through censorship and ideologies of a develop a kind yeah. of developing ideas, right? Yeah. So. It doesn't work if I do whatever things mm. there. Because yeah. even if I become critical, it can also be an alternative of content to them. Right. It doesn't quite matter, in fact, even. So so this becomes like I cannot really overturn them. So yeah. I will not. So being independent meaning that you're mm. very alert about these kind of borders. Yeah. Um, and values. So otherwise, whatever you have been thinking about, you have mm. been whatever, becomes too fragile and meaningless and they are dismantled even. Yeah. Or, or go opposite to what you have been struggling for. Right. And the kind of money you use and the kind of space you use, these two things, very right. important. Mm. Right. Although I, I do feel that one thing that the residents uh, actually must have taken away from the whole experiment uh, is to be able to uh, think of the wisdom within the community. I don't know if, if they're relocated in one single place, uh, all, all the people are relocated in one single place or they are all dispersed in different parts. And I don't know what's the sense of community now. So if you can tell yeah. something about that. Yeah, so Ding Hanchao is now under demolishing. So mm -hmm. there are some areas already being demolished, but I am now researching on with a group of young uh, college students, yeah. uh, interviewing uh, one particular uh, area in Ding Haichao uh, called Lane 449. And mm -hmm. we're interviewing them their personal history first. Yeah. So uh, the thing is that once they are demolished, they will be offered some housings Okay. Uh, uh, so they can purchase some housings with the kind of money they got as compensation, okay. but that's not enough. 
And these housings can be very at the outskirts of the city. Uh, If they all decided to go there, they will go. Sometimes they will they happen to be living with their neighbors, but horizontally. Okay. Horizontally. So it's going to be high rises. And then that's the only leftover uh, archaeological typography we have. Right for relocation, right? So it's going to be, so this will change, even if it's your neighbor, but it's now like two, three stories down. Yeah, yeah. And earlier it was next, next, next door, and we are all on the street. We are all living on the street. Now there's no, nothing. There's no street and we are living one above Above the other. other. Mm. Yeah, the other. So this is one thing. And um, this is just the end of the story, but in this process of demolishing, hmm. there will be a lot of struggle within the family. Yeah. Because the government will give one slot of money to the family, hmm. not to the families which will split because brothers will not live with each other anymore. Yeah. Hmm. Earlier they might, uh, they hmm. might not, but that doesn't matter. Whoever hmm. wants to live living in Hai Chao, whoever don't want to live, they don't have to live in their brother's house yeah but then they have this hukou which in china is yes. a registration right we have hukou so once you have a hukou then you have a claim then yeah. all the relatives and brothers and sisters will come and ask for a part of it yes and whoever used to live there continuously will only get whatever they agreed mm-hmm. and that money will be much smaller than whatever yeah. you can afford elsewhere so this the government will not care Mm. to make the game simpler they will only communicate and bargain uh, with the family household Mm. Mm. not with you as an individual so there's no individual there's no individual feeling there's no individual stories Mm. in this there's only one slot collected which is a family and because of this many families will just collapse Mm. because there's too much hurt too much profit as if they think Mm. to be negotiated Mm. and to be battled on even so they will just never meet again after this Mm. so this has happened everywhere yeah but of course there are like happy more happier endings especially Mm. for those who rent out their home Mm. And who have been living outside anyway, who has been successful. Right. Uh, and this place for them is just money. Yeah, right, right. Hmm. Um, Chenyun, maybe you can stop sharing your screen now. And uh, oh, okay. I, could, uh, I could ask the audiences to post in their questions. But, um, but yeah, this trajectory of, um, of uh, you know, uh, the redeveloping sites in like which is so similar to um, India actually in Bombay um, that it's kind of really um, it strikes a chord and uh, there's so much case study that actually can be shared. I will actually um, kind of uh, turn to the questions now. Uh, Rupali has a question. So Rupali, uh, uh, Dipti, if you can help us get Rupali on the panel and she can ask her question. Rupali, you're mute. Huh? Yeah, thanks so much, Chenyun. I think, um, you know, what, what was, I mean, there's this whole sort of energy, right? Like there's, <laughs> you spoke about the idea of like Dinga Chao, I think more than mutual aid. And I think it seems to me like there's a sense of mutuality, you know? There's the kind of, there's a sense of public that kind of gets generated, right? Out of all those energies that, uh, that come together. And of course, 51 persone, you know, I mean, we've been talking about this idea of the energetic self that produces the city. And, and each of those 51 persona is in some ways this kind of frenzied energetic self that is producing uh, the city in, in very different ways, right? Um, and then you start, you, you see the other one, the, the, the kind of urban renewal process that sort of empties out that, that sort of energy, right? So I'm just, but, but, but what I'm seeing, you know, and I, I mean, really sort of, spending so much time in Shanghai and, you know, seeing a lot of this, this energy, this mutuality. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, where is that potential energy going? You know, mm-hmm. it, <clears throat> right? like with, with urban renewal, it's not something that can just be squashed completely. There's all that potential energy. So I'm just wondering, you know, are there other, you know, places that it's moving to? I remember this conversation where 
I think it was Professor Lowe who had this group of people, you know, artists that he was talking to. And then he found like this one platform that was censored. And then the whole sort of discussion moved to WeChat. And there's this whole sort of, you know, energetic discussion, a whole sort of public realm that got reproduced somewhere else, you know, on WeChat. So I'm just wondering, I think, what, how, what is, where are these energies moving to? And are there other kinds of mutualities? Are there other kinds of spaces uh, that are being produced in this, in this whole sort of urban renewal process? So, I, yeah. Mm. So I was recently observing some um, phenomena uh, recently uh, on, in the past two years after uh, after I stopped working in a particular place, uh, but uh, working on paper, I, I'm still observing how the, the situation is developing. Because now the, sh uh, the rent is becoming so expensive, uh, I think now it has become a more personal space that is working rather than a collective space. For example, um, uh, I have recently a friend who has been moved to Shanghai and we observed one thing. First, Shanghai as a big city uh, has attracted more interesting people than other non-big cities, which is for sure. But there is, it's a particular type of people that Shanghai attract, which is in ordinary level, at least who can survive in such a cost of living. So only those who can survive in this kind of cost of living, meaning that who has some wisdom in earning money or who has inherited some money. So these people are not totally non, not interesting. And since we have no other choices but to work with these people, uh, so what she does is she is now working on wood block print. Uh, so she is inviting them individually to her home and talk to them to have private conversations and do wood block print with them together and to create something by hand, which all these people who is very busy living in Shanghai find very relaxing and rewarding. And by gradually this, first she is not renting another place which is expensive and which will give you a lot of uh, pressure of how to make full use of this space that you're not waste money. Uh, so she's not adding extra cost. Secondly, it's a very personal space that she's working on. And I also observed that there are other spaces, which is tiny spaces like a, a bookstore or just a living room that my artist friend are, 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 are um, renting, which is the only thing that we can afford. Now, just especially in the city center, you can just afford one room. So just by this one room, you invite people to come and discuss and share and whatever. So to this extent, I think a, a very spectacular kind of uh, movement is not quite possible, but these personalized ways of understanding and sharing is there. Also because since 2017, the whole censorship and political pressure and the, the kind of capitalism uh, has, has also uh, evolved uh, so that only maybe the personal level can work much better. Um, meaning that you enjoy still more freedom and also it's more productive and more in-depth. So if, for example, it's still a group of artists, then you are still maybe dealing with art world. So it's still quite a world that you are dealing. But now I think many of my friends are interested in personal. You don't even have to be working with a world. So you treat yourself to a more manageable time and space. And you, you grant each other more flexibility. Yeah, and, yeah. And on the other hand, I think the, the art world now is really not working. So mm -hmm. whatever they feel good about themselves, I feel I'm more interested in reading WeChat news of my maybe real estate agency friends rather than artist friends. Because the real estate agency friends, they tell more directly about what's going on in the city. 
Mm. And I have one artist friend who is a performance artist friend who has recently working because he, he has no money. So he is now working as a real estate agency mm. uh, person. So I'm very interested in, and I, I really want to ask him to show me around and see different real estates. Yeah. And to know the people, their needs, all these things. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, yeah, I mean, I think that will be really nice to kind of look at how that public realm is sort of reconstituted. And, because, I mean, I still can't, you know, believe that it's, it, it'll all sort of, you know, flatten out completely. Like, I remember the Shanghai Biennale. I remember that, that long serpentine queue, you know, of young people waiting outside to kind of get in and, and this spending so much time, you know, like looking at work, spending time sort of with the questions. So I, I just feel like it might be interesting to start looking at, you know, more carefully where these sort of energies are moving and going to. And like you said, I mean, you know, like in, in places where you do not expect, you know, with like the real estate groups, what are the conversations? How, how are the yeah. happening? That'll be really nice to kind of follow up. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah. But in fact, uh, 2016 is really like the end of a good time. Yeah. <laughs> which is very true you know i i can't presume that oh it's a uh, it must be somewhere else <laughs> it looks like we witnessed the end of the world exactly. but yeah I, I can't i i still can't get myself to believe that that is possible so yeah probably more hopes here <laughs> No, I'm sure that with your curatorial um, efforts, you can, um, I'm sure you can rebring uh, that energy back and those conversations so. back. Uh, there, are, uh, uh, th yeah. th there are two you more can questions. Take me away from here. We can continue with the question, others' questions. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, there's a question by an anonymous attendee. Uh, he or she is saying, thank you for the wonderful journey through your story. Regarding the forced eviction stories from your experience, how can we tell stories that foster hope instead of defeatism or overwhelming feelings of surrender? Mm. Well, this, uh, this is a fundamental question, in fact. Um, yeah. These things, I think, I, I, I think when this audience, I don't know if, he's Indian or not, I, I, I kind of understand the kind of things that he's thinking about because I was in Shahingbab uh, in 2019. I deliberately go there mm. and want to be there. And I happens to be a female. So I am very honored to be within Shahingbab mm. um, with the other females. Um, oh, this is like an ultimate experience to me that I can hardly bring this back and even if i tell others uh my chinese friends i don't think they know what i'm talking about and that's very depressing because i it's not only because due to the limit of my own personal start language capacity mm. it's also because we have never had that mm. even close to that so how can i tell a story even mm. which is very encouraging to my peer friends mm. who just cannot, cannot feel that. Mm. We are very far from that for at least 30 years, mm. since maybe 1989 or whatever. Mm. So this is a very difficult thing. Mm. So, but this is very crucial also because if we cannot do that, then how can we say that we are relevant to a recent history, mm. as a history as recent as that? Mm. So it's not about, to encourage Miss Chen, like strategically, how can she re continue to, this is one thing to, to now she's because of COVID, she's now in US. Now, of course, well, this is one thing, how she continued to recover her dialogue with the government. This, this is one thing, but a more difficult thing is how can I tell Chen's story to someone else and make him believe that it's true, even when he's just living next door? Mm. So the thing is now in, for example, in Dinghai Chow, people will not believe my story on Miss Chen because this is the kind of story that if you don't experience, you will never believe. Mm. So uh, I ask those people to write down their witness because 
they are the closest to this experience、mm. because Miss Chen himself, she can hardly talk because she's she was then arrested for disappeared for eleven. So how can she talk and write pleasantly again or、yeah. in whatever form language? But all these others, I ask them that you have the responsibility because you see, you、mm. should write. So this book, whoever write it, then has contributed to a story、yeah. which can. Be more a bit more readable,、hmm. only a bit more readable. So it's still far from being part of another person's、yeah. life history again. So I think this is so crucial a thing, and I feel that it is、uh, an ultimate goal of an art worker or、hmm. an intellectual just、hmm. to bridge this gap of sensation.、Hmm. Like, how can I? Retell the story of Shahinbag to、yeah. to my Chinese friends, and how can I tell the story of Miss Chen to to just to her neighbor、mm. who feels like irrelevant, just irrelevant and、mm. feelingless?、Mm. Um, so one way of doing it, I'm just exploring many different ways. Is that you know now it's、uh, Dinghai Chow is under demolition, so I'm trying to. Create a journal for the local people through、mm. one man who is my connector,、mm. and she 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 he is very good and、uh, very responsible. A, a man、mm. who was born in nineteen forties, so he introduced his friends for、uh, the younger generation to interview, and I tell them that you just interview whatever you're interested. And then we make them a journal. So we don't wait for the very last day when everything is disappeared, and then we give them out a, a kind of documentation of stories.、Mm. But we just make them part of a journal、mm. when they are still there, when、mm. the future is so unsure, uncertain,、mm. and make this journal accompanying them、mm. throughout this experience.、Yeah. So this journal will not become a record of a past,、mm. but a a. a But, but an evidence of something has been living mm, and mm. can continue to live, maybe.、Right. So I ask them to do the、uh, do the interviews,、mm. and then they make them a journal and they publish、mm. it and give them to the neighborhoods、mm. and the people, and then they will understand oh what they are doing,、mm. and we will understand what we are doing,、mm. and then we go on for the next edition and we make it fast and quick,、mm. and then people will feel that they. There is something else that is very important because、mm. now even those residents they are abandoning. You、yeah. can't imagine once they heard that this place is going to be demolished, they are throwing, giving away their flowers,、mm. and then every year there's a lady who has been planting very good fruits, and、mm. this year she stopped planting,、mm. and she said that she is leaving. But who knows who who knows. When she will leave, she doesn't know. There's no single detail policy has come. Yeah. So this is the strategy the government plays that they will not allow you to know the the the, the strategy until the very last moment. Okay. And they will not explain,、uh, other than what they want to explain to you. So they are still in a kind of dreamlike、uh, status,、yeah. and we as outsiders, we know that. First, it will not come smoothly. Second, it will not come immediately. And third, it will not come as what you want.、Mm. <laughs> so we are distracting them from these、yeah. things and asking them about their old photos,、mm. their personal life history,、mm. uh, their life here, and what they remember.、Mm. This is something that they try to 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 throw away. Right. So this is a kind of movement that is not going with them even. Mm. And that's not going with what the government wants them to go mm. that mm. kind of direction,、okay. and they are do、uh, they are accompanying them and adding to their experience. And、yeah. then this might work or might not, but at least this feels more living. Mm. Like. Mm. 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 So I don't think I have a very good like final solution, but it's very important. No, it is very difficult. Yeah, it is a very difficult question, and I think. Uh, I was reminded of you know、um, this book by Susan Sontag,、uh, where、uh, called regarding the pain of others, and she is actually engaging with this question that why do we look at photographs of war,、uh, mm-hmm. and at the same time, and she kind of、uh, you know meditates on this question so very beautifully、uh, in a long essay, and、uh, on the other hand,、uh, there's a very interesting.、Um, 
uh, talk I attended by Dr. Kavita Singh, um, who actually asked the question in a slightly different way, asking that, why do we need, uh, need war museums? You know, uh, and um, so I think this, these are difficult questions, and um, and I think they it's such kind of projects help us reflect constantly and keep our morality in check. Uh, I will invite uh, Prasad to make his comment. Uh, Dipti, if you can help me get Prasad on the panel. Hi. Uh... Hi, 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 hi. Uh, thanks, Jenny. Uh, I mean, uh, it's always so much pleasure to uh, to uh, to be listening to you, actually. And uh, uh, what you have done is quite interesting. And uh, uh, you know, and it's interesting for all of us who are kind of you know engaged with communities. The idea of community, you know, with people. Um, of the city. And what you've done is kind of uh, reconfigured the city for us. Uh, a city that is not like generally we speak of cities in terms of institutions and infrastructure and these kind of things, right? So what you've done is you've reconfigured it to us uh, as a city which is which which were were uh, a, a city of uh, these uh, practices uh, which are uh, uh, the practices of compassion the practices of care the practices of uh, you know uh, cooking and storytelling and walking and uh, uh, writing and making journals and massaging and the 51 persona is full of these uh, uh, these stories uh, and when you when you start looking at the city like that, in terms of you know, in terms of uh, these practices uh, and 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 these uh, uh, forces uh, uh, which are which are which are constantly kind of you know uh, making cities, and then to kind of you know think of uh, think of uh, uh, your own practice and. Our own practice as an, as urbanists, as as people trying to engage with the material of the city, then that opens so many doors for us to kind of you know think of cities. Because otherwise, what happens is over here when we speak of communities, we speak of making a a better plan for communities, a better policy for communities, you know, a better. Uh, system of infrastructure for communities. Whereas you're saying that, well, all of that will happen, but then there are then there are people who are kind of, you know, living lives, you know, by dancing on the streets, by saying poems, by cooking, by making friendships, by, uh, coming together and chatting and talking and all of those things. So you kind of, and to enter the city from there, you know how do you kind of how do you kind of how do you kind of engage there and then and then kind of you know uh, uh, and then I, I remember accompanying you in uh, some of those uh, 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 trips of uh, 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 51 persona you know so uh, 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 workshops uh, what uh, you called it workshops with these people one day one day uh, visits they they host us they host uh, they host the visitors. And that gives you another completely different idea of the city. You know, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, and, and the city and the entire city kind of you know, becomes this uh, 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 a gallery or or or, a, or or an or an event to visit. You know, so, so many so many kinds of practices. So I think I think it was it was very good to 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 to, to rethink and reconceptualize uh, the city. Uh, in this in this manner, uh, Rupali spoke spoke about uh, the energies, you know. But uh, it's, it's, it's also energies, and it's kind of it 
but it is completely kind of you know turning the city around and then figuring out how do you how do you how does one engage you know because 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 otherwise we tend to we tend we we talk in terms of oppositions and resistances and protests and you know which are which are of course important and have their places but these are you talk in terms of practices and then and the practices are so not so clear also not so clear they are they are they are momentary they come and they go and and you find immense possibilities in in moving that you know and and they respond to very local conditions and uh, uh, local conditions not in the sense of uh, you know space locally but but the time local you know at that moment what do you respond to whether you are responding to you know uh, uh, some geopolitical issue or whether you are responding to a national issue or a local issue or whatever so so and then that gives you so many possibilities and in that incoherence and that difficult and and that and that absence of that uh, 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 you know trying to make the uh, the big plan better you find so much you know uh, uh, to do actually to kind of you know work out and to to live through i felt it i felt it was a very nice it kind of you know gave gave directions to kind of move beyond the idea of making plans better or making infrastructure better or or things like that to kind of you know figuring out ways in which you can engage uh, with different kinds of smaller plans probably smaller infrastructure smaller moments and smaller fun so that that was very good uh, thank you so much uh, you know uh, always a pleasure uh, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Prasad. It's very kind of you to say so. One thing uh, that you will find why I'm always looking at these things is because other things are not reachable and not arguable. For example, I I want to find some urbanists in China who are also architect, but they're zero almost. Once you become an architect in China, meaning that you become a businessman or just a yeah. Just an expert, uh, how to say, just a professional, and some of them, some sometimes they they know what they are doing and they know the limits, but at the end at the end of the day, they are not supporting other things, mm -hmm. or sometimes they think they are supporting, but it's like too trivial, and so they they don't know the kind of level that you can work on and meaningful, and you can add your talent to it, so they are either. In most of the time, 90% of the time, working with a big boss, yeah. serving the big boss, uh, and then left 10% of the time, they're doing something that is not significant at all, but they think it's very meaningful for the society with some independent practice and some ideology. But compared with the 90% of this evil that they have been doing, I don't know how can they feel happy about themselves, but they are very much with, I think that the Chinese architects as I know, they are very, um, I mean, the mainstream, not everyone, of course, but the mainstream, they are very happy with this kind of structure and split of, uh, of human nature on them. And they are, they, so I, I think if there is a big depression uh, in economy and they all lost their job, and, and I think they finally maybe can do something good that they don't even know. <laughs> And they won't themselves not recognize, and then they're doing good to the society. <laughs> so there were, there's no big planning that is good in China at all. So how, so, <laughs> so this is not part of my world to, to deal with either. And I don't think I am even, I want to bother to criticize these planning because it's so useless even to, to criticize these design or yeah yeah no it's not it's like, like it's not like like i'm not i'm not a critique or an opposer of this big infrastructure or a big plan or anything like that you know it's like, it's like it's not. but 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 the city does not happen only through them you know it, it, it city happens through many different uh in different scales and different times and different you know uh engagement and you live your life in all of those so many different engagements and and city requires all of that form to hold it actually and that's why that's why you know because because 
because and that's the that's the thing with architects architects uh, or planners they kind of you know focus on those larger big plans and a good plan and a better yeah. plan and this kind of thing yeah yeah no, thanks thanks <laughs> yeah yeah but uh, thank you chenyun um, i think we have no other questions so far and uh, but we have uh, we have actually kind of uh, had a lot of interesting openings today um, and uh, and like uh, prasad said um, this whole dimension of social space uh, opening up the idea of social space uh, through architecture and how architects can actually engage with that i think we got some very interesting clues uh, through your practice and your engagements with and through your journey also and i think that 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 will be a really big take away for us from this this discussion so uh, everything i take you take away from me i i took away from you in fact <laughs> no that's that's very kind of you uh, to to keep us in your thoughts and uh, and the 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 feeling is likewise and uh, thank you so much enyun uh, i think we can we can close now uh and uh, and thank you for sharing so much warmth every time uh with us uh and we really uh we really hope that we meet physically soon uh when the world is active again uh and i would like to inform my audience that uh, uh next time we'll bring one more practice uh from uh, a, a context which is not close to us we'll be uh, talking to uh, members from coopia uh, who are a bogota mexico based team uh, and working with community projects uh, over there uh, so please do join us with another conversation on uh, building agency and until then uh, uh, stay tuned to our uh, portals for updates thank you so much enyun uh, i also want to um, mention okay no i think uh, we'll we'll announce some things later okay <laughs> thanks enyun uh, thank and you. thank you everyone for joining us Okay. Thank you Anuj. Thank you yes. everyone. Thanks.